Tonight, we're very lucky to have Jim Barry, who's the Western Massachusetts Regional Coordinator for the, develop for the Department of Energy Resources in the Green Communities Division. And he is the one, he's one of the most knowledgeable people I know about all matters pertaining to renewable energy and energy conservation. Among other topics he'll touch on tonight are municipal aggregation, which a lot of towns are dealing with now. Many town meetings will have a word article about municipal aggregation, including Sunderland on the town meeting warrant. He'll talk about what's coming after the SREC 2 program. He'll touch on renewable heating systems, maybe electric vehicles, the solar rise program, um, mass save, and other home energy conservation programs and more. Jim Barry has over 15 years experience as a town official, including serving as the public select board of Belcher Town. He served on the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Belcher Town Planning Board, and Belcher Town Housing Authority. He was also key in the formation of the Belcher Town Energy Committee, and he was the director of the land trust. In his role as Green Communities Coordinator for Western Mass, Jim provides hands-on, locally-focused assistance to communities in the western region of the state as they partner with the administration in pursuit of a cleaner and greener energy future. And since the Green Communities Program started, 210 cities and towns throughout Massachusetts have been designated as Green Communities, and over $80 million in grant funding have been awarded to these municipalities. And I can tell you for a fact that Sunderland here would not be a green community, nor would we have achieved everything we have achieved without Jim Barry's support, guidance, and encouragement. It also helps to have a dedicated town administrator and an active energy committee, but we could not have done it without this man here. So please give a warm welcome to Jim Barry. Thanks, Aaron. Now I know what my eulogy will sound like. <laughs> so uh, I put this slide up first so you have an idea of um, where I fit in the whole grand scheme of things. So I work for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which means I work for you. Um, in this chain of command, there's a governor, lieutenant governor, the secretary, the commissioner, the director. There's a deputy director in there someplace. So I put that there so you know where I am on the chain of command. So if you have any questions that start with, why would you? The answer is, I, 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 don't, I don't usually participate in the whys. Once a policy is made, then I help to explain it and to help you get through it. But I don't create policy. I don't write legislation. Um, I'm not even sure they listen to me if I suggested it. So Aaron asked me to talk about a variety of things. Um, I do this occasionally. I go to other small towns, um, talk a little bit about energy efficiency. I suggested it, and he said, yeah, well, we, we could, we'd be loved to have you. So we made a kind of a list of things we could talk about, and I have enough slides and oxygen to talk for four or five hours on all of this. I have no intention of doing that to you. I plan on touching on all of them really briefly with the intention of focusing more on whatever it is you want to hear about. So this is a interrupt me as I go process. Uh, the first kind of question I'd like to ask is, so I see uh, Buckland and Conway and Sunderland here. Is there any other towns represented? Okay, so, so you're all green communities and you all know what that means, which in the short version is you were able to jump through hoops, five specific hoops that were defined by the legislation. And once you jump through those hoops, you got the green star on your forehead, which means you have access to money to spend on energy efficiency, energy efficiency, energy efficiency in town buildings. So that's what I do is I help people understand what the hoops are and jump through hoops, then get the money, then spend the money so they can ask for more money and spend more money. So that's, that's kind of what we're going to be doing tonight. I thought I'd break it into what I think is the most important thing is saving energy and then maybe generating energy and then on the individual basis and then how we might come together as a community and do things together. So it's kind of like three major topics with a small blurb on EVs at the end, because there's a couple of them out in the back here, if anybody wants to go look at them. So the first thing I say to you is energy efficiency, energy efficiency, energy efficiency. Before we talk about doing green electricity, we should talk about using no electricity, the megawatt. It's far more important than the megawatt. So turn the damn lights off, turn the TV off. You don't have to leave it on to the dog or the cat. You just turn it off. 
So the first step that anyone should consider when even thinking about this topic is going to MassSave.com, MassSave.com, MassSave.com. You go on the website, you give them your zip code, they give you a phone number, you call the phone number, they send someone out to your house to do um, energy audits, energy equipment, they offer you contracts for air sealing or insulation. We had extra insulation added to our attic. They paid 75% of the extra insulation, up to $2,000. I've been told that that incentive has now been changed, that there's no max, so if you need a lot of insulation, they'll still pay up to 75% of it. They come in, they swap out light bulbs for you. They do free air sealing. They go in the cellar and with the spray foam and go around where the concrete walls, it's a two by four. They insulate all that. Has anybody here not had it? Mass save audit? Yeah, I didn't think so. so we're, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on stuff you all know already. But it's a, um, you're allowed to do them every couple of years. So if you haven't had one in a couple of years, you can ask for another one. Things do change over time. The program changes. They offer different things. Uh, the zero percent heat loan is a is a great thing if you're doing a large project. There's a new program, a new pilot program, an MVP program, Home Energy Market Value Performance. I have a question. Um, does that uh, mass save money apply to new windows? You need to Generally not. Windows, um, as you may or may not know, are a poor conductor of, um, actually they're a great conductor of heat. Heat goes through them pretty easily. Um, a lousy window. Let's a lot of energy out. A really, really good window lets a lot of energy out. So if you spend lots of money on brand new windows, the money you save in heating is not much. So in terms of our grant program to municipalities, we seldom pay for new windows. We uh, often pay for new um, exterior windows, storm windows, or sometimes they put the storm windows on the inside of the building if it's a historic building because the historic people will murder you if you try to change out windows on the outside. So we do storm windows on the outside. I don't think Mass City pays for any windows for residential people, primarily because of the, the cost return. But this is a new program. Instead of getting a Mass Save audit, you sign up with one of just a few contractors in the state that has joined with the Commonwealth to do more energy efficiency stuff than typical in a mass save. I don't know if they'll even talk about windows, but they will do bigger and better things, more in-depth energy savings things, and the contractors get paid by us, by DOER, based on how much energy they can save. So they will come in and they'll uh, look at the whole house, they'll analyze what it's currently using for energy, they'll make some suggestions on what you can do to save energy and itemize it in uh, predict amount of savings, and then they do the work. If they get those savings, if they achieve the savings, the state gives them money back, and theoretically, they're supposed to share that with the homeowner. So this is a, a relatively new program. Contractors are paid for energy savings. The customer receives home scorecards, so you'll have a, an actual number of how well your house is doing on a generic scale compared to others. So if and when you go to sell it, you can say, look how good my house is. I've got a really great score on my house compared to another house that doesn't do so well. Maybe your house is worth more because it's more energy efficient. It's not, it's one thing to say, well, my house is really energy efficient. You should give me more money for it. It's another thing to have a piece of paper that says, and by the way, someone has tested it and shown that it really is energy efficient. So it has a little bit more value to it. Um, customers remain still eligible for whatever national save rebates are there, so you're not losing anything by going to this other program. And rebates from the Mass Clean Energy Center for things like air source heat pumps or um, wood stoves, change outs, are also available. So this is a, if you're thinking about doing a bit more than just a mass save audit, this might be um, worth, it, worth checking out. So the pilot is good, it will allow zero interest up to seven years. It does air and duct sealing, which MassSafe does not do. More insulation than in terms of um, other kinds of insulation. I was told that if you get a MassSafe audit and they do insulation, they only do certain kinds of insulation. They don't do every possible kind of insulation. So with this, these folks can use all kinds of insulation. It's not limited to just what MassSafe has already. Electric heating and cooling equipment uh, improvements whole house or room heating systems. You may have seen air source heat pumps. I'm going to talk a little bit about them a little bit further on down the line. So those will be included in it. So renewable heating systems. If you want to add a pellet boiler, 
uh, as an adjunct to your heating system. These are additional things that you can get with help from contractors that are focused on these things and above and beyond what the Mass Save program is about. So you can get the wireless thermostats, you can get, look at this, high performance windows. But they must be really good windows. It says, no, many Energy Star windows do not meet this performance requirement. So it's better than standard Energy Star. It's Energy Star on steroids, perhaps. So windows are not out of the question. And mechanical ventilation is also possible. So that's it for how to save energy in your home. Uh, the next kind of topic, we talked about no-cost mass aid program and MVP. We're going to talk a little bit now about generating electricity on your own place. Does everybody know what solar is? Um, obviously, there's some pictures of different versions that they have. Uh, how does it work? We know how it works. The photons from the sun go through the glass, they hit the new electrons are kind of loose in their orbit within this thing and they all get knocked out and they, these loose electrons all go in the same direction along the wire and you got electric current. It's a, it's, electric current comes down here into an inverter, it runs the washing machine or the TV and if you don't need it because you're not there then it goes out in the wire into the street and the government, the uh, utility pays you for it. So we know what net metering is, uh, the incentives, SREX are disappearing. If you already have a system and you are already signed up to receive SREX, do not worry. They're not changing. If you don't have a system and you're thinking about doing one, do it tomorrow because the SREX program is in place, is still in place until it's not in place, which is sometime this summer. And the SREX program is sunsetting sooner rather than later. And it's going to be replaced with something called SMART. <laughs> Another acronym. It's a solar mass renewable target. So the short story is with SREX, as you probably know, you receive a financial benefit by having electricity on your roof because you're not buying electricity from Eversource and the price of Eversource goes up and down. So here's what you're paying for Eversource that you don't have to buy anymore. And by the way, you get these pieces of paper called SREX, Solar Renewable Energy Certificates, that you can sell and the price of those can go up and down. So that's what this red is, the SREX value that may change. In the future, you're still going to save the energy by not buying it from Eversource, and you're going to get a different incentive called a smart incentive, which if you'll notice based on these pictures, it ain't is the same. It don't change. It's going to be predicted when you first sign up. And it's going to stay the same for the life of the system. And as the price of energy goes up, the value of the incentive goes down. So the total dollar you receive from your project is constant and predictable and bankable. That's theoretically the, the big plus of this. The banks love it, the financial people love it. It's you and I don't love it because we're making less money. And those who are already in that first program, they stay in that program? Yes, sir. Oh. If you've got the SREX, if you if you got SREX, you can stay in SREX. But what's the cutoff? Bit? So for example, if a person signs a contract to get an installation before the cutoff date, is the date and when they when it's, the program, is when it's it installed, it has to be installed and connected to the wires. Because the connection is what can take months. Right. And months so months. if you're physically connected but not yet turned on, yeah. because ever sources, <whistles> you'll still be in the SREC program. So we, we don't, they don't want to hold a gun to your head because ever source is doing something stupid. Mm -hmm. But it's it's gonna it's gonna happen this summer. So if you if you sign the contract and you're working on it, you want to get it on the roof sooner rather than later. So I think the um, SREC program goes for ten years. Right? Yeah, once you sign up for it. Yep. Right. And what about the new program? Is that also ten years? Uh, so yes, it's it's either ten years or twenty years, depending on the size. So, so after there's... ten years, if you're on the SREC program, you're done. Is that right? Well, after you're. After 10 years of the SREC program, and you, you, the 10 years starts when you sign up to become an SREC and you're qualified, at the end of 10 years, you no longer receive those SRECs to sell them, but you could sell normal RECs, not the solar specific renewable energy certificates, but the old fashioned class one renewable energy certificates. You could still sell those, but they're worth like uh, a fifth. much less. A fifth? Thank you. I was, I was wondering if it was a tenth or something, but a fifth might be right. It, it's not worth a lot of money. And similar with the SMART program, once that fixed dollar amount is defined when you get into the program, after a certain number of years, either 10 or 20, depending on the program, at the end of that, you could also be eligible to sell normal RECs rather than SRECs. But again, they're not a whole lot of money. 
And if you're trying to encourage more people to do solar and to do the right thing, then don't sell any RECs, either SRECs or RECs. Because if you're selling them, the utility can buy them and they don't have to do anything else. But if you don't sell them, they gotta find somebody else who's doing it. So somebody else will have to go. So there are some people who do solar and don't take any RECs because they're trying to say, I want, I want to encourage this, this market. So in the SMART program, you said before, as the cost of energy goes up, the incentive goes down, so that the total is the same? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what that picture's trying to show. I think I have another, yeah. The other, the other interesting thing about, and it's defined early on. So right now, the SREX, I have no idea what my SREX will be worth four years from now. I don't know. But if I had a SMART program, I would know exactly what's going to be the total dollar value. So if the price of electricity goes up, then the incentive that they pay me goes down. But I'm always getting an exit. 30 cents a kilowatt hour for the electricity I produce. The other thing that the smart program is trying to do is guide people towards doing solar in different areas. So they give you more money based on the location or more money based on the kind of person you might be or more money based on if you have storage. So building mounted gets more money than, uh, building mounted gets better than, the, when it gets to flat them out, it's a great big field of solar. That, that's 30 cents. If you put it on a building, you get 32 cents instead because they're trying not to take up land. You know, so you make better use of land. If you put it on a brownfield, a capped landfill, or an industrial zone that's been closed, you get an extra three cents. If you do floating, I'm not sure who's going to be doing floating, uh, landfills, solar canopies are worth more money. You can take one out of this column if you want, and an additional one. So if you're a public entity, so if someone called me saying, says, I'm having trouble was Granby. Granby was trying to get people to go in there and do solar on town land. So he couldn't get anybody to come in and do a big project because they were worried about the SMART program. I said, well, eventually they're gonna to come to you because they can make more money doing it on town property rather than private property. Right? This community shared solar, there's extra money for that. Years ago, they gave away a bunch of money when we bought solar. It was called a rebate just for buying. Then they switched to the REC program where they're gonna pay you to Produced electricity, that was SREC. And then they said, you know, we gave quite a bit of money away and the industry's doing well. So they went to SREC 2, which is a similar program, but they're worth less money. And now they're going to even less incentives because they're trying to, you know, theoretically, the solar industry doesn't need as much assistance as it used to. So they're trying to guide it, that's the goal here. Um, here's another picture of, here's the price of electricity changing, but based on the fact that you thought you're going to, when you sign up, you're going to get 30 cents, it stays the same. It's just another picture of the same thing. So SREC2 is an incentive market based on a value that can flotate. The SMART is, all comes, compensation is established up front. You know exactly what it is. It's both the value of the energy and the value of the incentives. The incentive is paid to directly to the project owner. You don't have to sell it to a broker who then sells it to somebody else who then goes right to the project owner. It's calculated all in at the time that we close the deal. If you're thinking of solar, there's a program that helps pay for it. If you know somebody who's thinking about solar and hasn't done it yet, the Mass Solar Loan Program is a state program that helps, encourages banks to let you borrow money and helps they help pay, buy down the price of the solar. Uh, the idea was, Many people go knocking the door to door and say, let me put solar on your roof. It won't cost you anything. It's just sign a 20 year contract and I'll sell you electricity off your roof for a discount off of what you're paying for every source. Now, worst deal in the universe, but it's not the best deal in the universe. The best deal is owning an outright. And we know that. So what we're trying to do is encourage people to buy solar. And some people say, well, I, I, I'm having trouble getting a loan or I can't, I don't want to pay 12% interest on a loan, right? Uh, I don't want to pay, a I can't afford a three year loan. So the state came up with this program that's a 10 year loan at a subsidized um, interest rate. And depending on your income, they actually pay off some of the loan for you. So in addition to getting federal tax credit to buy the system, you can get the state to buy off some of the loan for you depending on your income. So if you know people are thinking of purchasing solar, they should go to masssolarloan.com or call me, you walk me I'll walk you through it. It's even eligible for uh, community solar. So some people, there's, this is happening more and more for a couple reasons. One of which is community shared solar projects will get more money from the SMART program. Many people who are trying to do solar can't do it on the roof because they have slate roofs or they got too many trees around. So they, can't, they just can't do solar.
community shared solar is someone's going to install a great big system over here and sell you 10 panels and sell you 3 panels and sell you 5 panels. Community shared solar. And you can use this loan program to buy that, into that. So this program is trying to be flexible to let everybody own some solar either on their own place or elsewhere. You can borrow from 3000 to 35000 It's just a 10-year repayment, 12 months of construction only. This is probably the key thing. If you have a household size of one and you make less than $45,000 a year, the state will pay 30% of that loan for you. Not many of us are in that position, but some of us are in this position. So depending on the household size and your income, we're fortunate that the annual median income that they're using is one based on the state and our income out here is usually less than the whole state, so we're already kind of lower than this often. My daughter and her husband, a, a household of four, make less than $132,000, so when they put a solar system up, the state pays for some of it, as well as help them find a loan at a lower interest. So it's a good deal. If you're thinking of buying, or you know somebody's thinking of buying, this is something to look into. So we talked about solar, SRX being replaced by SMART, the next thing is how we might work together as a group rather than individually doing our own thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about municipal aggregation because I said if I don't, I can't go home. So I have to, I have to talk about that and I want to get it done before he beats me up. We're going to talk about solar <coughs> rise and we're going to talk about heat smart, which is a bunch of different renewable heating systems and a, a process as well. Municipal aggregation is an interesting thing that happened many, 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 many years ago when they were first thinking about separating the electric utility systems. The utilities, the utilities used to own the generating plants where they burned oil or coal and made electricity and they owned all the wires and the telephone poles and the meters. They owned the soup to nuts. At some point somebody said, you know, if we separate this out into two separate projects where somebody makes electricity and sells it and somebody else delivers it, then maybe there'll be some more competitive going on and the prices will come down. Well, it didn't work, but it's still, <coughs> and at the time that they did it, they said, if we're going to have more and more people selling electricity, because it's not going to be a monopoly on the utility, anybody can make electricity and sell it <coughs> to the utility, we're going to have lots of people making electricity, maybe we should have people pool their resources together and do a group buy. So municipal aggregation is a way to have a group on for electricity for everybody in the town. So the process is where a municipality purchases electricity in bulk for a competitive electric supplier instead of the investor-owned utility standard rate. The transmission along the street, if somebody hits a pole and knocks it down, the utility still comes and fixes it. It has nothing to do with how the electricity is delivered. It has something to do with the, where the electricity originates from and who gets paid for that and how we pay for it. So it can include energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. So if we had a group of people getting together and they wanted to do a group purchase, they could say to the person they're buying from, oh, by the way, I don't want any coal-fired electrons or nuclear-fired I only want wind or I only want wind and solar. Or you can tell them what you're willing to buy. Now, the price is going to change, right? But you have that choice of how you define your RFP, Request for Proposal, so you can figure out what you're going to buy. Um, and participation is, is um, voluntary. So when the first came out there, I was thinking, so everybody in town can get together and buy electricity. Well, how am I going to get everybody to sign up? Be, so what they decided to do is, everybody is automatically signed up. If the town meeting votes to do it, and the board of selectmen goes out to an RFP, and they go through the legal process, and they go out to bid, and they get someone to say, yes, we will sell you electricity. Everybody is included automatically, but if you choose to, you can opt out. So rather than having everybody sign in, the default is you're in, unless you already have your own competitive supplier. Some people may already do that. Maybe you have electricity through Constellation or your friendly horse farm that was trying to sell you electrons and they were getting a discount that they were. There's a lot of people doing that. There's people going door to door. There was a big thing with the Attorney General recently that a lot of low income folks in Springfield. People are knocking on doors and say, here, sign this, I'm going to save you electricity. And maybe the first month it was cheaper, but the fine print says, oh, by the way, it goes back to it. So it's not a great idea for you to buy your own electricity through a competitive supply without being real careful about what you're doing, maybe get some help. Um, but with a group purchase, then you have a little bit safer. 
So it's all voluntary. There's a, a section in law about how it works. It's, it's non-trivial. So I wanted, to, I wanted to highlight this point here that the transmission is provided by an investor-owned utility, and we're only talking about the electricity that we buy from the person who's making electrons, not the people who are delivering it. So somebody sent me an electric bill, which is 50 bucks for a month. I said, holy man, I'm gonna go move in that house. Huh? Must, must have no lights on, no TV, no radio, no alarm clock. So this is a standard bill, and it typically comes in two sections, a supply section and a delivery section, which is impossible to read. So I blew it up a little bit better for you. This is just that section of the, ele of the electric bill. So for this particular customer, Used 194 kilowatt hours in the month. The first, the generation service is worth uh, 10 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And this is the, all the other stuff that the supply, the person who's delivering it is charging us. And this is the part that Eversource can change every six months. So this, when they say that Eversource is raising the rates by uh, from, 20, from 10 cents to 12 cents, we're only talking about half of the bill. When you're talking about aggregation, and you're gonna go buy electricity from somebody else, they said, we're gonna sell it to you for 10 cents. Well, you're already paying 10 cents, so you're probably not saving any. I mean, if you took your whole bill and divided it by 194 kilowatts, you're gonna say, holy mackerel, I'm paying 20 cents a kilowatt hour. You're gonna sell it to me for 10 cents, that's great, where do I sign? But you're, he's not selling you all of it for 10 cents. He's only selling the generation part, the electrons. There's still a charge to pay for the person who fixes the telephone poles and wires and everything else in the building. So that still occurs. So when you're thinking about aggregation or you're thinking about competitive supply and they offer you a price of nine cents, you say, remember that's only for ha about half of your electric bill. In this case, it's, less, it's more than that. In your case, it's more than that. Uh, well, $20 for the supply and $30. The other charges are more than right. the generation. Right. In some cases, it's a little bit closer to 50-50 because um, this number gets uh, floated. This is this seven dollars is a flat fee, not by per kilowatt. So somebody who's doing 600 kilowatt hours, it might have a higher number here and a higher number there. It might be closer to 50-50. But you're absolutely right that it's about half. Um, this is often higher. So the price of the bread is a lot more money than the person who delivers it to you. And all you're buying is the bread. You're not paying for the delivery. With this deal. Yep. You might want to point out where the efficiency is there. That's what pays for mass save. It's just a, it's, it's right, yeah, right there. So he's paying three bucks to help pay for your mass save. Right. If you're paying electric bill, you're putting money in the bucket. So you might as well call mass save and say, come on out and do something for me because I'm paying for it. Right? You might as well do it. So that's what municipal aggregation is it's a group buy only for the supply side, not for everything. Why do people do it? For many years, nobody did it because electricity was cheap. And when it was first breaking up into two or three utilities, and they thought there would be a lot of people doing this, turned out that it wasn't going to be a lot of people doing this because it's a lot of money to start a new electric power plant. If you and I said, hey, let's go make some electricity and sell it. Yeah, well, you got five or six billion dollars to, to, to build a nuclear power plant and then wait 10 years while they build it. No, we're not going to do that. So it didn't happen. So, but eventually people, as the prices started going up, people said, well, you know what, maybe we should think about it because a lot of group purchases do save money. So when we ask the question, why do musical aggregation, the answer might be save money. My answer to that is maybe, depending on what you're doing, depending on how long a contract you have. So once you get involved with this, just like you can today go out and get a competitive supply for your own electricity, and it might be a one-year contract, might be a three-year contract, might be a five-year contract. The longer the contract is, maybe the number sounds really, really good. But you don't know what the standard ever source is going to be like. See, it's really kind of a gamble, right? What sounds good on the first six months might not be great in the last 18 months. So are you going to save money? Yeah, maybe. It used to be two, three years ago. I forget when they changed it. When I first started, which is only eight years ago, um, you could not take the contract as a municipal aggregation if the price they were offering was more than your, what you're currently paying. Couldn't do it, they wouldn't let you do it. So at least the first X months of the contract, you were saving money. Now they don't require that anymore. 
you can still choose because it might very well be that you're foreseeing that the price we're giving you is higher today, but it's a fixed rate for three years, and we know it's probably going to go up, so they would allow you to take it. So now that prohibition is not in part of the law. So pricing stability is what a lot of people are interested in. They don't like the fact that every summer the price of electricity goes up. That's because the demand goes up because of air conditioning. Right? I mean, that's, that's why. So electricity changes twice a year, you know, winter and summer. Um, both Eversource and National Grid both do that. They go to the, they go to the Department of Public Utilities and they say, look how much we're spending on electricity. Look how much we're spending on power lines. The hurricane knocked all these lines down. We've got to replace them. So we've got to add money. Into, so the price of the delivery goes, changes every six months. So the price of electricity you buy goes up every while. So some people are happy about having in some cities and towns, in particular, would rather have a flat rate, they know for three years, that they can put in the budget and not be freaked out about in two years if it goes way up or down. So pricing stability is a reason that many people go down this path. More and more municipalities or towns are doing it because they can get greener products. So Greenfield does municipal aggregation and they have 100% renewable. Um, MAPC is something like FERCOG, only it's out in the Boston area. They have a product that they um, were helping towns do, and that's also green. Uh, and FERCOG is trying to, I thought was trying to help everybody. I know, what I just learned tonight is FERCOG is helping people who are interested in doing it get together to talk about it. But you can use our room and talk about it, but we're not going to get too close to it because we're not going to get too close to it. MAPC actually got pretty close to it, and they have a, their website has a lot of information. I don't know if you got a chance to look at theirs yet. MAPC is FERCOG in the greater Boston area. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're in their program is very similar to an organization called SERPAD, yep. Southeast Regional yep. something. And that's what those people are saying. Like yep. MAPC, yep. Where, where they took 26 towns or something and they all aggregated together. Right. And, and that's what FERCOG is trying to help us do. Right. FERCOG is trying to not do what HCOG did, yes. Hampshire Council of Governments, which did that with Belchertown, that's where I'm from, Belchertown. And they did a whole bunch of towns together, but the language that they were using turned out to be less than make the letter of the law, and they were turned down after many months of struggling. So FERCOG probably says, I'm not going down that path. Can I just say a couple of things about IBA? Sure. Um, uh, so, so, so you're, you say save money, and maybe, but you're right, it's not guaranteed, but I've been looking at a lot of aggregations and their prices, and every one of them is lower than ever service. And the right. aggregations that offer the same service that Eversource offers, the same amount of green that Eversource is required to put in, I have not found one yet that is more expensive than Eversource. No, but there is no guarantee, and the Eversource price goes up and down, and the aggregation prices are much more stable, but I cannot find one that's more expensive than Eversource. And the other advantage is the programs, the individual supply that the Attorney General's office has just found are really a problem. And she's trying to get the legislature to change the legislation to outlaw that or to remove yeah, yeah. that from a possibility. Um, but they all charge you like $100 to leave that program. Right. You sign a contract and it's very difficult to get out. Right. Whereas the aggregation by law, it's free. You can right. get out at any time. Right. Anytime you don't want to be in the aggregation, you can switch right back out to the utility or right back to an independent supply right. if you want to choose your own. Yep. The aggregation, and that's right in the law that it has to work that way. It, it's, it's, yep. it's free, you can leave, you can come back. Uh, you're not trapped in the aggregation. Right. The point I was making about saving a lot of money, if you're using 200 kilowatt hours a, year, uh, a month, and you're going to save a penny per kilowatt hour, you're saving 20 cents a month. So, so yes, you're very, <coughs> you're very likely to save money, but you're not going to save enough money to buy a car. So I was just looking at all the other aggregations here in Franklin County, and they're all at about 11 cents a kilowatt hour. Right. And Eversource is now 12 something. Eversource is currently 10 and a half. Oh, that's an old bill. Uh, no. No, it's not an old bill. Is that right, 10 and a half? Oh, has it? Maybe that's some new summer price. Uh, what month are we in? Now, so winter is cheaper, and this is the winter price. Summer is more expensive. Price goes up in the summer because of electricity demand in this uh, for uh, air conditioning goes up. 
Um, there's a process to the way it starts is someone talks to the board of selectmen saying we should at least consider this. <laughs> and if the board of selectmen says yes, we agree, we should at least consider it. Then they bring a warrant article to town meeting and they say to town meeting, we would like to consider this. Please authorize us to go forward and look at it. It doesn't mean we're going to sign a contract. It doesn't mean we're going to sign a contract that uh, strangles you or doesn't strangle you. It just is not. Town meeting is asked to authorize them to go forward and try to get a good contract. And if they find a good contract, you're authorizing them to sign it themselves on behalf of the town, but you can get out either immediately or any time thereafter. So the process is you got to start with a vote, then you got to prepare a plan in consultation with a consultant and with DOER. We look at the, uh, the consultation. We look at the rough plan before it goes to DPU, Department of Public Utilities, who are the folks that regulate Eversource and go out to bid. So that, that's, there's a big process. The plan is non-trivial. Uh, there's a whole bunch of elements to it. It's, you're going to end up with a document that's about this big in terms of the plan, organizational structure, operations, funding, activation, and termination, um, methods for entering and terminating contracts. There's a whole, the legislation specifies what must be in the plan by chapter. And it's like, you know, doing a term paper for a teacher that you don't like, and you have to just do whatever they want just to give it back to them, right? And put it in the right format. And just do it. And get a consultant who's done it once before, so you don't have to think about it. Why invent the wheel? Uh, it's got to meet all the laws, of course. Must act, uh, ensure universal access by all customers. You have to make sure that everybody in town, residential and commercial, businesses, municipal, everybody within your municipal boundary uh, has access to all this. That's usually pretty simple. That's I mean, you put that in the RFP, and it's got to happen. So it's clearly outlined in the, in the legislation. Um, equal treatment of all classes of customers. You don't, you can't charge the um, business people a whole lot more money than you charge the residential people for that service. So DOR helps make sure that the plan looks good before you send it to DPU, but DPU is the one that either blesses it or not blesses it. If you want green products, you gotta put it into the system early on. Make sure that there's full disclosure of renewable energy certificates. So we talked about SREX, Solar Renewable Energy Certificates. There are other kinds of renewable energy certificates. It's not just solar. So there's wind, class one, class two, which is a whole other variety of stuff. So you can say to them, I, I want all of my stuff to at least have a rec attached to it, which means someone else is making sure and ensuring that it's green electrons rather than brown electrons. Is that each town that specifies that, or is that the total number of towns aggregated together that specifies that? I'm on camera, so I'm gonna be real careful. Each town is going to go out to bid on its own, separately and individually. It may very well be that two or three towns have a plan that looks identical to each other, and they all go out to bid on the exact same day, and that the bidders are hoping to capture all three or four towns all together, but it is one town, one plan, one bid, one contract per town. That's where HCOG got in trouble, because that, that part of it is illegal to say, we're all going out together and we're all, and then we got to fight over who, who, which, which contract we take. You get four bids in seven towns, we, what if there's six towns and it's a three? So, yeah, each town wants to write their plan and their RFP to be explicit. If you want green products, you got to put it in there. The generic one from three, four, five, six years ago didn't have this stuff in it. People weren't, weren't asking for this. Might cost a little bit more money, but it cost, the added cost for green today is substantially less than the added cost for green 10 years ago because there's more recs around. There's more people trying to sell them, so there's, it's, it's easier to get. Um, and go, go do some rate comparisons, right? Go, go to DPW. The DPW website will show everybody who's got an aggregation plan. You can click on the name of Ashfield and go see Ashfield's plan. Or so you, can, you don't have to invent the wheel. That's the idea. And you can have an energy plan. So if you wanted to have, if you want to use one of the towns, and it added a 0 .00005 cents per kilowatt hour onto everybody's bill, and that money went off to decide to do energy efficiency stuff like Mass Save, but that's non-trivial. That plan has to meet the same requirements that the Mass Save plan has to meet in terms of it being a three-year plan, have very specific goals about kilowatt hour saved or terms. It's a it's another whole section to the aggregation plan. Some towns have done the aggregation first, and then they amend it to have an energy efficiency plan attached to it second. Some towns never get to that piece. 
some town site and just smirch it together? Well, given that mass site exists, why do that? So when I was in Greenfield a gazillion years ago, they looked at how much money the town was paying in the electric bill, and they went to that charge on the bill and said 0 .005 cents times how many kilowatt hours, and they looked at how much money the town was contributing to mass save, and how much money was coming back to the town, and they said, we can do a better job. Give us the money instead. But it's not trivial. One town uses a, a little bit of an uh, adder to it, and they use it for a sustainability director and energy outreach and education, this kind of thing. Not instead of mass save, but for other energy services related stuff. But again, you have to be real careful how you word it to get it past the DPU because there's only, you can't take, you can't add a penny on every kilowatt hour and use it to run the schools, right? Because that's, that's illegal, it's not part of the legislation. So it has to be something related with energy. So are you saying that Greenfield does not use mass save? I don't, I'm not sure that they do. You know, I don't, I didn't look at the final plan to see how much of it they got. I know they did something with green electrons. I don't know if they did the energy plan piece of it or not. I'm not sure if they did or if somebody else did. Anybody know? So if you call Carol Collins, she's an, she's an amazing woman up there. She's a, yeah. Nancy might know, but Carol Collins runs the electric program for the town. Nancy, Nancy knows everything about energy and sustainability in the universe. She's an amazing woman, but Carol Collins runs the ag aggregation program. She runs the aggregation program. There's a large aggregation on Cape Cod. They were the first aggregation in the state. Cape Light Contact. Cape, yeah, and they do their own mass save. They took the mass save program over. Right, they don't have mass save on Cape, period. And Cape Light Contact does a much better job of spending the money. Avoid these potential issues. Do, make sure you, your plan does what you want to do, not what your other towns are doing if you're kind of in the consortium. Follow the process, understand the plan. You need to have quite a few of these kinds of meetings to explain to people because when it first hits the mailbox, it's like, what the heck did the town do to me? I'm not getting, I'm not getting electricity from Eversource. And people are going to freak out. So you need to have outreach and education and all that stuff. One other thing you might do as a group to do your energy bill it's called Solarize. It's a, it's a Groupon for solar panels. So if you're thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about getting solar and somebody else is thinking about getting solar, you might decide that we're all going to go together and try to get solar together. And there's a program called Solarize Mass that the state created five, six, seven years ago. It's a community-based and driven education, outreach, and group purchasing program aimed to increase the adoption of small-scale solar through a competitive installer selection in tiered pricing. So if a town wanted to do it, and maybe two or three towns together do it, they do an RFP to Boston. Boston says, yeah, sure, we know, it looks like you got your act together. Boston helps you put out an RFP to solar installer and say, we have X number of houses in this geographic area. We're looking for a discount on solar. Tell us what kind of a price you'll give us. Uh, tell us what kind of equipment you're going to use and tell us if that price will drop based on the number of people we help you sign up. So the idea is increase education community outreach and make it simple for people to buy solar. If you're part of a solarized program and you talk to a certified solar installer that was chosen through that process, you have a better feeling in your belly ball. Am I talking to someone who's going to be here five years from now to have good equipment? Because we're going to help you install, we're going to help you check the warranties and check the equipment and make sure what they're selling does work. So it's sort of a simple process. And the idea is by doing it together, we can shrink the sales cycle and shrink some of the soft costs that the developers have to use to find you and you and you. Because now they can come to town and have a room for 20 people and make a sales pitch to one and maybe. So theoretically, they're going to offer a discount because as a town, you're helping them sell the whole system. So that's the concept of Solarize. Mass Clean Energy Center and DOR, we help with the RFPs. We help engage technical consultants. We don't have you, you go figure out who to hire or what kind of equipment they should use. They suggest things. You're gonna get four or five proposals from four or five solar developers. We send them to Boston and the geeks look it over and say, okay, what kind of equipment are they using? Is this, is this, is this crap or not crap? What's the minimum requirements that it meets? And then when you get different proposals from different developers, they will help you understand apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. But eventually the town chooses one of these folks and they become like the preferred installer for the town for a fixed length of time. 
then you help get them customers and everybody gets sold at the cheap. You did it in Buckland, it worked out well? Excellent. Yep. So we just finished the program in Conway. Conway, Coleraine, and uh, Shelburne, I think. Shelburne. Did a program, the three towns, I don't know, I think they might have gotten 100 solar projects in the three towns. They put out an RFP that hired the solar store from Greenfield, John Ward and Claire. They came, they were Great the people. solar installers. Uh, everybody is happy. So I will say that the installer that we chose, Direct Energy Solar, no longer has a presence in our area, Western Mass. Um, but they are, they promise that they're going to keep their maintenance issue. Yep. We've had no problem. Tiny towns can't do it on their own because there's not enough headcounts. So we allow the four towns to group together. They don't have to be contiguous because then the developers say, well, I can go to, to Buckland and Shelburne the same day as opposed to Buckland and Belcher Town. But you know, you guys choose what you want to do with that kind of thing. We offer the town money to help with the education stuff and with edu uh, brochures, lawn signs and stuff. So the, the state kind of helps you <coughs> do this whole program along. And as you'll notice, those of South West here are much smarter than the people in the central part of the state because we actually have done it. We've done this numerous times. So 2011, 2012, these are different groups that have done it. So that program worked fairly well. And so they did another one called Heat Smart, which is the same concept, but instead of solar, they're going to do group purchasing for renewable heating and cooling technologies. It's going to target residential and small commercial installations. And again, it relies on community volunteer leadership to help get the word out and educate folks. It's based on the solarized model. And the things we're talking about are four possible options for renewable heating. Modern wood heat, pellets. So they make today boilers that you can put in your cellar instead of an oil boiler or propane boiler. It burns wood pellets. They deliver it by truck into a great big thing in the bottom of in your cellar. It automatically gets fed into the thing. You don't carry bags of pellets and pour them in there. That all happens automatically once a month. You, I'm going to get there. Once a month you go in and you pull the ashes out and put them in the garden. So wood pellets is one of the options for homes or small businesses. Northfield has a, a wood pellet boiler in their town hall to replace their oil boiler. And they have a big silo out back. The truck comes and instead of pumping oil into a tank, the truck comes and blows with air pellets into a tank and it's fed with a screw down into it's amazing. Um, our Board of Health in Buffalo is very against pellets. Um, they say it's then they need to be educated because they, they need to be educated because these pellet boilers are as clean as an oil burner. Well, the boiler itself may be clean, but the process of making the pellets and, and um, the cutting the trees and all, they, I feel like they've done a lot of research. I don't know if you know what happened, but... Um, um, I don't know. I don't know. That's, I'm I just know. saying that's what our Board of Health is. I believe it. There are lots of people on the planet that are opposed to lots of stuff. There may very well be one or two of them on the Board of Health that are but have no reason for it. I don't know. I haven't seen what their what their problems right. are. Right. I do know this these are lots of them around. So the town of Ashfield and the town of Sherman <coughs> have wood pellet boilers heating their schools. And Furcock is heated by a wood pellet boiler, the building the train station. And the hospital in the center of Northampton is heated by uh, not wood pellets, but by wood chips. So if you're going to do this program, a solarized type program, but with renewable heat, you could pick any one of these four. You don't have to pick them all. So that's the wood pellet option. Another option is cold climate air source heat pumps. I'm not sure if you've seen these. These are called, sometimes they're called mini splits. They're called air pumps. Often it looks like a, a big box on the wall inside the house, and outside the house is a compressor. A cold climate air source heat pump works just like a refrigerator. A refrigerator uses compression to take a fluid and put it under intense pressure, and then when it releases it through a valve, that pressure um, absorbs heat or it gives off heat. I forget which one. That's what makes your refrigerator cold, is compression. So they took that concept and they said, well, can we actually heat a room with this? I know my refrigerator is warm. So they did. They engineered it to the point where these things are sophisticated enough to heat your home. We have one in our house. It's in the big room, the big room, where the TV and the couch is. Where am I? I'm in the big room. <laughs> With the air source heat pump on, because it's warmer. I turn the thermostat down in the house so the oil heat is not coming on. Heat the whole house because I'm over here getting warm on it. So that's a cold climate air source heat pump. 
Five years ago, we were not pushing them because they weren't really good in cold climate. When I got down around 20 degrees, instead of it using a lot of compression and getting heat, it turned on electric heat, um, electric resistance heat, which was not efficient. So those are really good down south. But now up here in the cold climates, they have systems that actually work in the middle of winter. A third choice is ground source heat pumps. As you know, if you dig down into ground, eventually you get to a spot where the temperature is constant, basically. It doesn't get any hot in the summer. You've got ground source heat pumps right in this building. The idea is there's a constant temperature down there, so you do the same thing. You put a fluid down there that gets to be whatever that temperature is, and bring it back up, and you run through a compressor, and you get more heat out of it to heat the building, or in the summer you get cold and you get cool the building. So ground source heat pumps are a spectacularly efficient way to produce heat in cold, but non-trivial when it comes to your checkbook. So if you're building a brand new building, or you're building a new house, and you're doing a mortgage, and you're doing a financing, and this is a great suggestion. If you already have a house, you already have a heating system, not many people are going to replace it with this item. It's pretty expensive. People do this to add to their house, but they seldom do this. And the fourth option for a group purchase of stuff that's renewable heating is solar hot water, which you may have seen. Uh, 20 years ago, this was a big deal. A lot of people had solar hot water systems on the roof. A lot of them stopped working. Uh, our neighbor got one 30 years ago, and, and it stopped working. They had a guy that was driving around one time, a retired guy, and he was looking. At, he says, oh, I, I recognize that. Knocked on the door, he says, you know, for about 500 bucks, I can swatch out some valves and get that working again for you, and that works perfectly again. So solar stuff does last, it does work. Solar hot water is an option. Yeah. Uh, is, is, is part of this program air source heat hot water tanks? No. So this is air. Uh, no, it's not. So it's no, not. No. They do. They do exist. They do exist. Yeah. But and there are rebates available for them, but there's not available on this group purchase okay. thing. Uh -huh. Yep. So in 2017, they came out with Solarize Plus. So a town could choose to do Solarize with solar PV that we already talked about and one of those clean heating source things. So they have two things they're trying to sell the town. So sometimes we're doing solar PV and solar hot water. Sometimes we're doing solar PV and air source heat pumps because the air source heat pumps use electricity. So you have solar panels on the roof, you have air source heat pump on the wall, you're using free electrons to run the TV and the heater. So it's the same concept as solarized, but you can do solar PV plus hot water or air source heat pumps. And the resident, once it, if the town offers it, the resident can choose one or the other or both. The resident doesn't have to buy it both. And then the last topic of the day is EVs, electric vehicles, spectacular machines, and there's rebates available. So the state still has a little bit of money left to offer you as a rebate to incentivize you to buy an electric vehicle, either a fully electric vehicle or a partially electric vehicle. So there's actually, there's like three classes of, of the, well, there's four classes. You have the all, what we call the ice machine, internal combustion engine. The second thing they did is they said, let's take this ice machine, put a battery in it, an electric motor, and boost it along. So I had a Honda Civic Hybrid 15 years ago that had a small motor in it, and every time you came to a stop, the car would shut off, and when you hit the gas, the electric motor would get you moving, because that's the, Inertia is where you're trying to use the most energy, and then the gas engine would come on, and the electric motor kept coming on and off to help you reduce your gas usage. So that was a, a hybrid. Then the Prius came out, which was even better, a bigger engine. You could run on a battery a lot longer, but still had a gas engine, and in the process of slowing down, it would replenish the battery for you. Then they had a plug-in hybrid, so they have a bigger battery. It works the same way as a gas engine and a battery, and the computer is smart enough to know which one to use when, and when you get low on electricity, you just plug it in. And if you have a plug-in hybrid, and then they have a fully electric car, which has no gas engine, that has to be plugged in. So those are the main kinds. We offer financial aid for fully electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles. So we don't offer money for a Prius, but the plug-in Prius we offer money for. We don't offer money for the Ford Fusion Hybrid, which is what I used to drive, but they offer money for the Ford Fusion Plug-in Hybrid because they're trying to get more and more people off of gasoline. There's a whole variety of cars. So this is a battery electric vehicle, and these are the plug-in hybrid vehicles. And if you don't believe it, walk out the back door, you'll see my Chevy Volt.
What kind of range you get on that? Depends on a lot of things. So temperature affects the battery. I got it last, I got my car last May, and in June and July, I, was, I would plug it in overnight, and I'd get in there, and there's, there's a gesso meter. A gesso meter? Yeah, so it knows how much juice is in the battery, and it knows about how many miles you can get on a kilowatt hour, and it guesses how many miles you can get on it. And that number changes as you use your battery, that number goes down. So when I get in the car, it used to be 250, and it advertises 238. My first guy was 238. I think that sometime in July it was getting up to 250. Two, I got to 300 one day. But part of it is not only the temperature of the battery, but how, what kind of a driver you are. So if you stomp on the gas a lot and you're going crazy, it's going to use a lot more juice and that gas meter is going to drop. If you drive around like an old man, well, then you get a lot more miles on it. When I got in the mass pipe, and I'm going to Boston, I set the cruise control at 69, 70 miles an hour, I get to Boston and back without a charge. Even in the winter, when that gas meter goes down because the electric charge is much smaller, because it can't absorb as much juice when it's cold. So uh, the, I think the lowest number I got in the morning was like 160. And uh, there was one day when I, I got to Boston, I said, I gotta find a place to plug in, because I was worried about could I get home. But in general, I can get to, I live in Belcher Town, I get out to the Berkshires, I get out to Boston, I get home every night. How do you know where all the plug-in station are? Because I don't see a lot. And we travel a lot, so I'm not thinking. <laughs> you have about what? We, don't, we travel a lot. Right? You have an app on your phone. And yeah, yeah, my phone. Sorry, I didn't know how did you find it. I said fund it. No, you find it. So I've got, I, I've got three apps on my phone, and you just touch it and says, okay, where's the nearest charger? Oh, and by the way, you can filter to be um, what kind of charger you want, because you don't want to use a Tesla charger if you got a Bolt. You don't want to use a Bolt charger if you got a Tesla, because no, these two, you know, Chevy and Tesla can't talk to each other, I don't know why. Um, and they have um, level one chargers, and level two chargers, and level three chargers, and they have free chargers, and not so free chargers. So you can set your app to say, show me anything, or you can say, just show me the ones I really want, the free ones that will work on my car. And it will tell you where the next ones are, and you hit another button, it'll give you Google Maps and get you right there. But generally, with 250 miles, I, I almost always go home. I still don't have to worry about getting there. There's a place in Boston where I park that has a free charger, so I always top up even if, I don't, if, I'm, if I'm low. You go to Northampton and park in the parking garage here, there's free chargers there. there so. um, the supermarket in Lee. So I was down, and I had to go I had to go to Lee and Lenox and Egremont and Stockbridge, and, and I was thinking, am I gonna get home? So I went to Lee, to this big Y, I plugged in for an hour, went and bought a sandwich and a, and a coffee, sat in the car for an hour and checked my email and got another 25 miles on my GOMI, my GOM, gesso meter, and made sure I would get home because so I wasn't worried about it. Greenfield has a Greenfield has, Greenfield has charges. They have a problem. Somebody okay, broke well, how, how do they charge? Do they advertise price? Sorry? How, how do they charge you? But, so there are some that are completely free. So the stop and shop is free. Northampton is free. The parking lot I park in is free. They absorb the cost of that as part of doing business. It's not a lot of money. I can fill my car up. I can tap off my car in Boston with electricity for about $2.50 worth of electricity. So if you compare it now and you have and using gasoline, how, how much it, how I'm, it compares? I'm paying, I'm paying, I'm paying off, I'm, I'm paying off the loan. The loan of the car. Yeah, it depends on how free you are, how much gas you save. When you drive your car, if you have a 25 mile per gallon car and you pay $2.50 a gallon, that's 10 cents per mile. He's got, he's got electric, or I got electric car, I get about four miles per kilowatt hour. Okay, and that, I mean, you know, yep, yep. So, he was, so that bolt he talked about has a 60 kilowatt hour battery, and when it's full, it gets about four miles per kilowatt hour. So he said the range is 238, 240 miles. That's four miles per kilowatt hour. And he can drive to Boston and back for 240 miles. Right, but the uh, price is... So at, two, at, at four miles per kilowatt hour, at about 20 cents per kilowatt hour, that's a nickel a mile. So instead of... Instead of 10 cents per mile. Right, so so if time. you're buying your energy from Eversource, you're still chart paying half the price per mile than gasoline. And if you have solar panels on your roof, like I do, you ain't paying nothing. Right. You charge at home. Then you charge at home. Now, if you go to your friend's house and you want to top up and you say, could I plug my car in? 
you know, it's probably costing them, you know, 10, 15 cents an hour while you're sitting there. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's, enough, it, it's not enough money to even think about. That's why they don't charge it. So that's why when Big Y puts in a charger, they put in a free charger because it costs a lot more money to put in a charger that then you can do credit cards or that you can it has to be connected yeah, to the internet. Yeah. You know, to make the charger charge the customer is so much more complicated. Eversource just wants people who can afford electric cars to come. I mean, uh, Big Y. They Big Y wants to attract those good customers to come there. How long do you need to charge a car? To charge it again for another 200 miles? Depends on how empty it is. For me? It depends well, on how empty it is. Just empty for full, oh, full range. Uh, full range. Right. Well, I've never had it full when I got it. Most people in their house have a charger that runs off 240 volts, like a dryer. And, it's, and it just is pumping 240 volt, uh, volts into the car, straight 240, just like your dryer. And that's putting out about six kilowatts. And so at six kilowatts, it would take 10 hours to pump 60 kilowatts, kilowatt hours into your car. So, but normally your car, my car is never below half full. Uh, you know, I mean, I drive around, I can drive 120 miles and my car is only half full. How many miles do we all drive in a day? Right. So, so my car is rarely at half full. Right. And, I, and I plug in and in five hours, which I sleep longer than that every night, my car, fills right back up. So it's for commuting, not for long distance. So the only time charging is really an issue is long distance. So if I were to drive, you know, down to Washington, D.C., I would have to look and see, I can go about 200 miles on a charge and where are their chargers, and I would have to think about it. And then you have to wait. Until and then, right. Yeah, right. so you have dinner. You go someplace and have dinner. <laughs> so. Or are stay overnight. Are there some chargers, that, some of the more expensive chargers, the different tiers will charge your car up faster. Right, right. So I think that right, right. Um, if you're doing it off your home, it can take overnight, but if you're doing it one of these higher speed chargers, it cuts the time. So the charger that we all have in our house is typically this 240 volt charger that would take, you know, five, six hours to charge your car up overnight. On the road, they have what they call high speed chargers that charge about five or six times faster than that. You get 90 miles back in the car in 30 minutes. Yeah. So we're put, the state is paying for them on the Mass Pike. So you pull over the Mass Pike instead of filling up with gas, you plug in to get free, free electrons and go in and have a cup of coffee and a hamburger and come out a half an hour later and get another 90 miles to go to the next rest area. The, the difference in the mindset is between the gas car and electric car. With a gas car, you typically wait till your gas is all gone, your gas gauge is empty. With an electric car, you have to think more carefully. You don't wait till your battery's all drained before right. you charge it up again. Well, it'll start screaming at you when it gets low. I did that just for fun to see what happens. It starts like, what are you doing? You're going to run a gas. Do you have go for it? It does take longer to charge an electric car than the five minutes it takes to pump your tank full. I mean, yeah. absolutely. You know, you got time. No, you're not going there. But by the time you're our age, yeah, you know, you got you plenty to go in and pee every couple of yeah. hours. You know? Yes. <laughs> And get a cup of coffee and you'll pee the next day. That's right. <laughs> How do the prices of regular car and electric car for roughly the same kind of car? How do they compare? The price of the car. Can I talk about my car? You want to talk about your car? Yeah. So I bought my car through uh, Mass Energy, which is the program he's going to talk about. A wonderful buying organization. Mass Energy is like a statewide solarized program. They have made deals with the car companies to sell cars. So they completely reduce the cost of them selling a car to zero. You go to Mass Energy, you can compare all the electric cars, you say, this is the car I want to buy, you push a button, it automatically connects you to the car dealer you want to buy it from, they schedule a time for you to come in and you buy the car. So, so they, Mass Energy makes it real easy to buy cars. So Mass Energy has negotiated a discount in the, for the dealers, they charge you less when you buy your car through Mass Energy. And a piece of that might be state money, but I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. So, so. But they will help you get the state rebate of $2,500 on a big car. Right. So, and there's a federal rebate of $7,500. So I got $10,000 off my car. So, so my car, Chevy Bolt, which I think is exactly what he has, the price of the car is $37,400. But you get $10,000 off between the state and the federal rebate. So now we're talking $27,400. 
And last year when I went and bought my car through Mass Energy, the dealer gave me an additional $6,000 off. So we're talking 21,000, 21,400 to buy this electric car. So and he fits in it. So this is not a tiny car. <laughs> oh no, these are, yeah. Right? Now, you know, you can find cars that you pay less than 21 for, but see, no, these, are, these are cars that have every bell and whistle you can possibly imagine. Yeah, uh, hatchback, big, big enough for four people. So this, here's a summary. Uh, I think we covered all the topics. Um, I think we've, we've gone plenty long enough, but I'm happy to answer whatever other questions you might have. Can you say something about the hot water? Pumps? Sure. So it's a similar concept in terms of compression. So it's an electricity, electrical driven device. It's a big, big thing you're going to put in your cellar. And instead of it, um, it produces heat, but it produces heat in a coil around the tank of water. So you get your hot water heated from the air source compression of the same technology that produces hot air in the wall of the air source heat pump in the wall. It's the same concept. But it's a, it's not as well known. Uh, there's only like two, I think, uh, manufacturers in, this, in the country that are kind of certified to get rebates, but there are rebates available for them. The Mass Clean Energy Center is another place to look for um, rebates on electrical appliances of all sorts. Um, so they do, if you need a new hot water heater, it's worth considering. Um, it also dehumidifies your cellar. Yeah. Right, oh, right, good point. That's a big one. So an air source heat pump also, the whole idea of compression and getting squeezing heat out of the air for the air source heat pumps, also do you minimize it. And the town of Rowe put one in their cellar of the library because they had a big musty problem in the cellar of the library with the old stuff. They put an air source, maybe they used that hot water. And they, they killed two birds with one stone. They, they dehumidified the cellar in addition to getting the hot water or hot air. What size water tank works with that? Um, I think they I think they come in 60 gallons and 80 gallons is, is typical, which is what a, a residence is. Um, I don't know if they had huge ones for. Yeah, I don't know that. Um, so there's no piece of it sitting outside. No, correct. No, this one has to be in the cellar. Yeah. So again, my my daughter and her husband, they finally moved out of our house. <laughs> they had no children when they moved in. They had two children when they moved out. <laughs> <laughs> they built a, they built the house right next door, so the grandkids can walk over. There we go. <laughs> but, when, but they built a house with ten inch wide walls, super insulated, air source heat pumps to heat the house, an air source hot water tank in the cellar. They don't have a, a furnace. They don't have a, a masonry chimney. Um, they, they don't. Have solar hot they have so, they have solar hot, they have solar panels on the roof. For heat, but not for hot water. They have both. They have solar. Uh, they still need. They have water. electric air source heat pumps for heat. They have electric air source heat pump for hot water, and they have solar panels on the roof making electricity for both. Oh, okay. And I'm gonna go out and plug my car. In. <laughs> <laughs> if I want to purchase the hot water heat pump, how do I get the rebate? The one who is selling it to me, he will give me a rebate, or how do I go about that? Possible. So when I got uh, my air source heat pump, and I was looking for <coughs> what rebates might be available, and they said that if I was going to get a rebate, I had to buy it from a only a certain manufacturer and only certain models that were good, and only if the dealer had been trained in installing it correctly. How do I and find this information? On the website, so go to Mass Clean Energy Center. So, okay. so Mass C E C M A S S C E C for Clean Energy Center dot com. When you get on that website, they have for your residence, for your business, for it, and you click on residence. Are you t you're looking for solar, or are you looking for hot water, looking, and it'll it'll walk you through the whole process. Thank you. We good? Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.